Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone out. Uh, if y'all would be going ahead and turning to the book of Esther, if you would. We're going to do a uh, study of the book of Esther. I know we uh, studied this uh, last quarter in our uh, Bible study, and some of y'all, I'm sure, have already heard some of this, but I, uh, it was it's stuck in my head. Plus, uh, Corbin likes to watch Veggie Tales, and there's a an episode of Veggie Tales that was on, and it's about and it's about Esther. And I saw things from a different light, and I just wanted to share a few things this morning. Uh, I've entitled this uh, this study Esther for such a time as this. The book of Esther was written approximately between 483 and 470 B.C. and is a relatively short book of the Old Testament with only 10 chapters. And this morning we're going to try to go through it very quickly, uh, hitting on the high, high points, almost a cliff notes, if you will, for the book of Esther. Uh, we're going to try to take away just a few things from this book that we can use in our everyday lives. The purpose of the book of Esther is to demonstrate God's sovereignty, God's loving care, that he provides for his people. And the book of Esther also gives us an account of how the providence of God can be set to work through people's lives. Esther was a Jewish woman from the tribe of Benjamin who grew up as an exile in Persia. Though we're more familiar with her Persian name as Esther, her Jewish name was Hadassah. The name Esther means star, and the name Hadassah means myrtle, a branch that signifies peace and thanksgiving, which, as we know, are two things that Esther did bring to the Jewish people. Esther was an orphan who was reared by her old and older cousin, Mordecai. Uh, in Esther 2, verses 5 through 7, we read, In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shemi, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jehoiakim king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Uh, we'll see that the book of Esther is unique in the Bible in and that the name of God is never directly mentioned there. The secondary characters in the story we'll see are King Xerxes, Queen Vashti, Mordecai, and Haman. Uh, king Xerxes, Xerxes, also known as King Ahasuerus, was a powerful king who ruled over 127 provinces in Persia. Queen Vashti was the wife of Xerxes, who refused to show off her beauty for King Xerxes. Mordecai was Esther's cousin and guardian, and Haman, the Agite, was second in command to King Xerxes, but as we'll see, always put himself first. Uh, chapter 1 starts with our introduction to King Xerxes, who displays his wealth for 180 days. At the end of this 180-day display of wealth and power, he ended that with a seven-day feast. On the seventh day of the feast, King Xerxes summoned Queen Vashti in order for her to display her beauty to all the people. Queen Vashti, however, refused and found herself banished from the king's presence and no longer in the position as queen. The process for finding a new queen then began. In chapter 2, we see uh, that Esther went through a selection process uh, and 12 months of beauty treatment before she is indeed chosen and made to be the queen. We also learned that Mordecai saved the king's life by alerting him of an assassination attempt. This deed was recorded in the Book of Records of the Chronicles. Chapter 3, we see Haman, honored by King Xerxes, and given a high position in the kingdom. We also see Haman's arrogance, his pride, and his hatred for the Jews when he becomes furious at Mordecai, when he refuses to kneel down to him. Haman's anger at Mordecai, a Jew, leads him to plot the extinction of all Jews in the kingdom of Persia. Haman then abuses his position of power to have laws made that would have all Jews in Persia killed. In effort to thwart Haman's actions, Mordecai calls upon the young Queen Esther, whom the king greatly favored, to seek an audience with the king. Now, 
this was not a simple thing or simple task that Mordecai had asked of Esther. One could not go before the king without being called. It just wasn't simple like that. Not even the queen. And that was at the punishment of death. Additionally, it was not known by King Xerxes or Haman that now Queen Esther was a Jew. Esther feared for her life and was very reluctant to do what she thought to be a difficult thing, even perhaps an impossible thing. In chapter 4, Esther's reluctance to approach King Xerxes is met by these words from Mordecai in Esther chapter 4, verse 14. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther agrees to appeal to the king. Chapter 5, we see Esther inviting King Xerxes and Haman to a banquet. Esther is preparing herself to inform King Xerxes about Haman's plot to kill the Jews, uh, of which she is one. Esther was still hiding that she was a Jew on the advice of her cousin Mordecai. At this time, Haman's hatred for Mordecai was still growing. While Esther received wise and loving counsel from Mordecai, Haman's advice came from the selfish misdirection of his wife and friends. Their suggestions led Haman to have a gallows, so-called, some believed to be a large spike, constructed on which he had planned to kill Mordecai. In chapter 6, we read in verses 1 through 3, That night the king could not sleep, so one was commanded to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers, who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. Then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed upon Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. The king, ruler of all Persia, then thought to himself, This man needs to be honored. But how best to honor such a man that saved my life? The king would ask Haman, What shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Haman, in his arrogance, thinks that the king is wishing to honor him and advises a lavish display of wealth and honor to be bestowed on the man publicly. What do we see as the king's response to Haman's suggestion? Chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robe and the horse, as you have suggested, <clears throat> and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who sits on the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. Perhaps a verse or two comes to mind for us that Haman may not have known. Proverbs 16, 18 through 19. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Imagine the shock, the anger, the humiliation that Haman suffered. In chapter 7, Haman's conspiracy against God's people comes crashing down in spectacular fashion. Esther reveals to the king that she is a Jew and that Haman has plotted to kill her people, her included. Events now take a drastic turn for Haman, who meets his end upon the gallows that he had constructed for Mordecai. Chapter 8, 9, and 10 shows Haman's children killed and all of the Jews saved. Four things to take away from this story. Number one, there is a preparation time. Esther allowed herself to be prepared for her task. If we look back and use Moses as, as an example, while Moses' first 40 years were spent in the house of Pharaoh, he had comfort, he had wealth, education, and was likely surrounded by servants all the day long. Then in stark contrast, Moses' next 40 years were spent in the desert, in a solitary condition, tending to his father-in-law's sheep. Moses' last 40 years 
were where, where he led the Israelites out of bondage. It took 80 years for Moses to get prepared for the work that he was to do for the next 40. <laughs> Refining our character is essential to God's plan for our lives, and we must work daily to find ourselves prepared. Point number two, God works in his own time and his own season. Over and over we see the providence of God, God's great design, and the perfect timing of events that are documented in the book of Esther. God will move in his own time. God does not function on our timetable. We are to strive to do the best we can as modeled by Jesus, as given to us in the Holy Bible on God's time. Ecclesiastes 3.1 To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose unto heaven. Point number three. Our past does not hinder our future with God. Our past does not hinder our future with God. Esther was an orphan. She was an exile. She did not come from a wealthy position. Uh, in a time in a country where women were often looked upon as weak and even seen and treated as objects, God still exalted her and used her for his purpose. If we look at the 12 apostles in the New Testament for as, an, as an example, though they became the pioneering leaders of the New Testament church, without God, without Jesus, they had no extraordinary skills. They were considered ordinary people. But Jesus chose them for a purpose, to teach and spread the gospel. As they were with God, they went on to do wonderful and great things. Our background does not determine what, we, what God will do with us. Our faith and our works do. And finally, point number four. God has a plan for us, even when we don't see it. Esther did not want these tests and trials visited on her. Esther did not want to be away from her family when she was taken away by the king's decree. It is likely that Esther did not want to be queen, and she surely didn't think that she had the strength and the ability to sway the decision of the king of Persia. But she did. A decision that led to the desolation of God's enemies and the salvation of God's people. Sometimes we, not, we may not see how or even be able to understand or comprehend how God's plan works in our lives. But that's not really for us to know. That's when we need faith. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Romans ten seventeen. What opportunities do we have laid out before us? today. Brother Wilder. What opportunities do we have? We heard the word Brother Holland had brought us about Esther. Uh, those of us that are already a member of the church, we know that if we have fallen short, have done anything wrong, we know that we can repent and make it right with God. But those who have uh, not never obeyed the gospel, maybe not have heard it, there are steps that you have to do to understand and what you had to do to get into the church. I'm going to read a scripture here over in Acts chapter 8. The, the unit, he was reading the scripture, but he didn't understand it. On Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 29, it says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. And Philip ran thither, him, and heard, and read the the prophet Isaiah saying, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept someone, some man, should guide me? And Philip desired that we would come up and sit with him. And so Philip went on and explained the scripture to this guy that he would understand that he could open unit. He had a chance to hear the gospel, to understand what he was reading because he didn't understand and another thing we had to do we had to believe what we have heard about Christ and read John chapter 8 verse 24 I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins for if ye believe not that I am he ye shall die in your sin so you got to believe what you've read in scripture Another thing, you got to repent of your past sin. 
Luke 13 and 3 says, And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. So you got to repent of your sin, and then you got to make a confession. Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. So these things you have to do. Also, you have to be baptized to become a member also. In, in uh, Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Lord and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So if anyone here that would like to become a member or have fallen short would like to make a confession and make it right with God, let us be standing. Brother Terry is going to come and lead us in the song of encouragement. Come to Jesus, he will say.